and go ahead. Our mission, Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents. Through support and resources offered, we aspire to help individuals become shining light parents, meaning a shift from a state of emotional heaviness to one of hopefulness and greater peace of mind. Helping Parents Heal goes a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and afterlife evidence in a non-dogmatic way. Helping Parents Heal affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background and encourage open dialogue. Attendance at all meetings is voluntary. All discussions that take place at affiliate-led meetings are confidential. We hope that participants will learn from and share with each other. Zoom meetings run by leadership are not confidential. These meetings typically feature guest presenters and are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members worldwide can watch and benefit. Neither type of Helping Parents Heal meeting is designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers, allowing parents to learn about many possible ways to heal. This includes presenters covering progressive topics such as afterlife evidence and connecting with our children who have passed. The views expressed by our guest speakers may or may not reflect the opinions of Helping Parents Heal leaders and members, so we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you could join us tonight. Yes, we are so glad that you can join us, and we're thrilled to have Dr. Melvin Morris. And um, I'm going to read a very short bio and then have Dr. Morris get started. Melvin L. Morris, MD, is a pioneer of near-death research, especially in children. He did the first gold standard prospective studies of NDEs, near-death experiences, after cardiac arrest at Seattle Children's Hospital and has numerous publications in the scientific and medical literature. He applies the lessons of the NDE to his research in the neuroscience of spirituality, applied remote viewing, energy healing, meditation, and personal transformation. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Melvin Morse. Welcome, Dr. Morse. Thank you so much. It, it's really, it's, a, it's an honor for me to be here. And this is really, um, th this is um, why I wanted to talk about this kind of research. Uh, because um, I, I thought that the grieving parents needed to uh, hear what we learned from our research at Seattle Children's Hospital. And I'm a former critical care uh, physician. Uh, I worked for Airlift Northwest out of uh, Seattle Children's Hospital and uh, did just dozens and dozens and dozens of flights of critically ill children uh, from uh, Alaska, Montana, Idaho, um, and uh, remote areas of Washington uh, and brought those children back to Seattle Children's Hospital. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, most of those uh, children uh, did not uh, make it. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I've not, you know, you know, I, I'm not my my. I, I haven't had a child. I've not lost a child, but I certainly have been at the bedside of dozens and dozens of children uh, who have passed, uh, and to my great astonishment. Um, uh, I just happened to, <laughs> I just happened to fall into um, uh, doing a research study on what actually happens when we die. And I trained at Johns Hopkins. Uh, so I, I, you know, the kind of the, you know, the traditional medical model is that uh, consciousness is created by our brain. And when we die, you know, we die, you know, just it's darkness, uh, you know, that's, that's the end. And um, I'm going to share with you uh, the uh, research that we did at Seattle Children's Hospital that uh, dramatically um, changed all of that for me. And just in, in summary, uh, when we die, we're conscious and aware and alert 
And we actually have an expanded sense of consciousness, a greater sense of consciousness than we have uh, when uh, we're alive. Uh, furthermore, at least for children, uh, the transition seems to be accompanied uh, by uh, 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 some sort of spirit guide or a helper. Uh, you know, in other words, we don't die alone. Um, we we die, uh, you know, with uh, with, with somebody uh, helps us um, uh, with that transition. And uh, particularly for me, since we do so many invasive and um, really, you know, difficult medical procedures uh, as part of the dying process, uh, you know, in our efforts to resuscitate um, dying patients. Um, it, the, these, uh, the children uh, do not suffer. Uh, that uh, in the, the uh, final moments of life, even, even the most traumatic, even the most traumatic uh, uh, situations, uh, the, uh, the is not a painful experience. In fact, it's, uh, <laughs> I, this, this is very counterintuitive. So it's very hard for me to explain this uh, without, I'm gonna get to the science of it in just a moment because one word that comes up again and again is that it's fun. <laughs> you know, um, one a child uh, who we resuscitated from cardiac arrest uh, she's told me, she said, you know, I'm not afraid uh, to uh, die uh, anymore because I know a little bit more about it, uh, you know, because she had, uh, you know, nearly died of cardiac arrest. And she said it was fun. And and I've heard that uh, more than uh, once. Um, so I, I know that, you know, at least for me as a critical care physician, uh, that, that certainly nothing about the experience uh, seems fun to me. But uh, I'd like to share with you uh, where it all started for me. Um, it started for me in Pocatello, Idaho. And uh, we uh, were called uh, to a seven-year-old child uh, who nearly died in a community swimming pool. And she was underwater for 20 minutes um, and had a very, very difficult uh, resuscitation. Uh, I thought uh, that she would, uh, in fact, you know, not make it. Um, it uh, told her parents that uh, they came in and prayed at her bedside. Uh, and, you know, we were, we, we really thought uh, that she had no chance uh, of living. Uh, she had a Glasgow coma score of three, uh, which uh, indicates, you know, how close uh, to death she actually was. Uh, and in fact, she made a full recovery. Uh, she was airlifted uh, to uh, Salt Lake, uh, uh, city to uh, primary children's hospital there. And three days later made a full recovery. And as soon as she woke up, she immediately asked the nurses, where was uh, Andy, um, who was uh, one of her uh, playmates uh, in what she thought uh, was heaven. And I happened to see her uh, for her follow-up. Uh, she just, uh, I just happened to be working in a community clinic there as well. And uh, she happened to just come in, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, uh, you know, just sort of a routine checkup uh, to see how she was doing. And she saw me in the hallway and she turns to her mother and she says, there's the man that put a tube in my nose. <laughs> and, and I was like, you know, uh, Crystal, um, yeah, I, I don't think you remember me, but I certainly remember you. Um, and she said, oh, no, I remember you very well. And she went on to tell me uh, everything that happened to her while we were resuscitating her. And she, uh, you know, first it was not painful. Uh, you know, she had the perspective that she was out of her body and watching us. And she described us, uh, you know, intubating her, putting a tube in her nose, putting her in a CAT scanner, which she said was a machine that looked like a donut. Um, uh, she heard me talking on the phone uh, to the uh, physicians at Seattle Children's. Uh, I was getting um, advice from them. Uh, you know, she had heard the incidental comments that the nurses made. And all of this was just astonishing to me. And she saw the look on my face and she pats me on the wrist and she says, you'll see, Dr. Morse, heaven is fun. <laughs> and, but here's what Here's what she said that so startled me. She said to me, I wasn't dead. I wasn't dead at all. 
some part of me was still alive. And she seemed as astonished by it as, as, as I was when I heard it, uh, as she described this. Uh, she described um, uh, after she saw everything that happened to her while we were attempting to resuscitate her, um, she uh, said that she crawled uh, down a, uh, a tunnel-like structure that was uh, lined with bricks and that a woman named Elizabeth came to her and that this woman uh, helped her and said, I will help you. And then uh, helped her uh, into the place that she thought was heaven. Um, th this family is a deeply religious Mormon family. Um, there's nobody named Elizabeth <laughs> in, in their family or they, nobody has died named Elizabeth. There's no Saint Elizabeth. We, we have, you know, there's no idea uh, where this, uh, this uh, you know, the, the concept of Elizabeth came from, except if there really was an Elizabeth who was there with her. Um, you know, so this wasn't something that she, you know, pulled out of, uh, you know, pre-existing uh, religious uh, preoccupations or, you know, or, or, or dogma or something. Uh, furthermore, you know, the idea that she's going down a, a crawling down a tunnel lined with bricks is not what she was told uh, heaven was like, you know, in, in the, her Sunday school and such as that. And that, that also struck me that the experience was just so odd. They were so idiosyncratic. You know, if, if she had just said, oh, yes, you know, I went up to heaven and there was angels and everything like that. Well, then I would have thought, well, maybe this is just some kind of, uh, I don't know, you know, some sort of hallucination or some sort of wish fulfilling fantasy or a dream or something like that. But no, it was filled with these very specific details and uh, many of them extremely accurate and many of them not coming at all from uh, her uh, religious background. Um, and that was my first uh, um, uh, hint that the processes of dying are not painful, but also that uh, this, uh, you know, in, in her case, a woman named Elizabeth uh, came to her and said, I'm here to help you. Uh, you know, so she, in fact, uh, was not dying alone, uh, but uh, was accompanied. Uh, this, you know, th this really uh, startled me, um, and I decided uh, that uh, when I returned to Seattle Children's Hospital, um, I happened to be working there uh, with the head of the Department of Neurology and the head of the Department of the Intensive Care Unit, and I told them uh, what I had learned, and we decided that we would see for ourselves what, in fact, uh, this was. So many of the questions that I often see people talking about near-death experiences. You know, are they hallucinations? Are they uh, caused by drugs? Are they caused by a lack of oxygen into the brain? Are they part of the uh, uh, psychological stresses of being uh, in a, a scary intensive care unit? Those were all the questions that we uh, designed a study to answer. So those questions have been answered now for easily 20 years. And, you know, I just, I, I, I want to share that uh, with parents so that you can feel, you know, people often say, well, do I believe, you know, in, in uh, near-death experiences or I do, I believe that, uh, that there's life after death, et cetera. Uh, you know, to me, these are a scientific fact. Uh, and the, the you know there's uh, the scientific uh, research on this is so solid. Uh, I often hear people say that science somehow doesn't believe in this, or that scientists uh, uh, don't uh, you know. But but scientists don't believe this. Uh, I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, I work with uh, most of uh, the people in this field of uh, near death research, but also with neuroscientists uh, trying to understand the spirituality of the brain, etc. And I'm not aware of any scientists who know the research, who do not believe that near-death experiences are real. So what does that mean, that near-death experiences are real? That means that that's the, what happens to us when we die. That's important, I think, for grieving parents to understand. Um, I, I was chatting with, uh, talking uh, with Elizabeth uh, prior to, 
uh, uh, talking to you all, and I wanted to understand you know, why this research would be important. And certainly we know that the process of dying are not painful. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it, I'm sure it's a spectrum. I'm sure that uh, it's probably painful to a point. And then uh, as, you know, the body starts to transition into death itself, uh, there is then a separation of consciousness from the body. And so the most uh, intense and, uh, you know, scary aspects of uh, resuscitation clearly uh, are not uh, painful. And then the second thing to know that uh, there is somebody uh, helps uh, the process of dying, I, I think is, is very important. But one thing that also occurs to me is that the near-death research, as I'm going to, I'm going to share, I, I'm going to uh, go through it with you. So, uh, you know, and, and you'll see it's, it's very uh, solid. But once we understand that this is true, then all of the spiritual experiences surrounding death and dying are validated. The things that are, are not easy to study. You know, I don't think that uh, we, we, well, we've tried to do studies of premonitions of death. Uh, and we have found, in fact, uh, that, um, uh, you know, that there, that there is a validity to them. But I think just that knowing that the research on near-death experiences is so real and so solid, that then the premonitions of death, the after-death communication, uh, even, even odd coincidences that, that you know, the uh, uh, you know, Christmas cactus that no longer blooms uh, when, you know, usually at the end of November, but now starts to bloom on the anniversary uh, of a child's passing. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think that uh, we can start uh, to also believe that those things are validated by the near-death research. Okay, so what is this research? We decided that we would look at this. We systematically studied all survivors of cardiac arrest at Seattle Children's Hospital over a 15-year period. We didn't we didn't accept, uh, you know, volunteers to our study. Uh, we didn't have people, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know. We we decided who we were going to study, and we didn't in any way tip our hands, you know, say, "Hey, we're going to study near death experiences in children." Uh, no, we said that uh, our study was titled um, "A Study of the Psychological Aspects of Surviving uh, an Intensive Care Unit Experience." And we very carefully match those children who survive cardiac arrest with control patients who also had a lack of oxygen to the brain, who were also treated with medications, who also had scary diseases, which put them in the intensive care unit and gave them the sense that they were going to die. But we as physicians did not see that them as being uh, actually, you know, this close to death. So we had a, a large control group of well over 100 children that we studied. And we studied uh, 26 survivors of cardiac arrest. And to our great surprise, almost all of these children had memories of their experience. And most of them had not even told their parents about this. So, you know, that's what was so uh, uh, astonishing about our study. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, they wonder, well, you know, are these people that, you know, that talk about near-death experiences? Are they just, they want to be on TV? Do they want to write a book? Do they this out of the other? The children that we studied, um, mostly, even their parents were unaware that they'd had this type of experience. And the experiences that they had were strikingly similar uh, in the sense that they had the sense that they were leaving their physical body, traveling down some sort of a tunnel. They were accompanied by some sort of a spirit guide or some sort of a helper, uh, and that they were conscious and aware. Um, is uh, I'm gonna now, 
Aha, we're going to try this out. Okay. I want to show you all one of these experiences. Okay. Can you see that? Yes, yes. Okay. So this is a child uh, who nearly died of bacterial meningitis, uh, had not told her parents that she had uh, any sort of experience. When we asked her why, you know, so, so she was just enrolled in our study. You know, so that, that's what I, I want to share with you is that, you know, we basically contacted these parents, uh, said, uh, we understand that your child survived cardiac arrest at Seattle Children's Hospital. We wonder if you would mind if we would uh, interview your child about the psychological aspects of surviving cardiac arrest. That's how we introduced ourselves. Um, and uh, it, the, in this case, uh, the mother uh, told us, she said, well, as far as I know, you know, <laughs> you know, she didn't have any uh, experience, but uh, certainly uh, uh, you can go ahead and interview her. Uh, to our great surprise, uh, she told us uh, that she did, in fact, remember everything about uh, her uh, resuscitation. And I said to her, well, why didn't you tell anybody? <laughs> she said, I didn't think you were supposed to be able to talk to God. <laughs> so, you know, so she knew that, you know, in today's society, um, you know, people who actually talk to God, you know, it's, it's okay to believe in God. It's okay to pray for <laughs> to, to God, but actually talking to God, you know, that, that must mean you're crazy. Okay. Here is her, um, uh, she, this, this is my partner, uh, uh, David Christopher, uh, resuscitated her. Uh, he has his position, his uh, arms, you can tell, tell his uh, arms right here are in perfect American Heart Association uh, uh, position for uh, resuscitation. Uh, she has all the little details of her resuscitation correct. Uh, you'll notice at the head of the bed uh, that the figure there is wearing a hat. That is correct. Uh, at our resuscitation, uh, we had our team leader to wear a hat so that in the hub of, res of resuscitation, the uh, leader can be immediately identified. Um, she then describes herself as uh, rising up out of her body. Uh, to In the top left is a, a rainbow that she said uh, it told her who she was and where she was to go. Um, and uh, then the, there's this figure here. <laughs> the, the, see, I, I love talking to children about these experiences because you know that you're hearing the real thing when you talk to them. Because she said to me that this is Jesus wearing a red hat sitting on a log. So, you know, that is obviously not something that she learned in nursery and, then, you know, in, in Sunday school. And you know, I said, well, how did you know it was Jesus? And she said, well, because he was talking to me, you know, just like the way that we know this experience is real. And that's one thing that is, you know, people often say, well, aren't these hallucinations? Aren't these dreams, etc." These experiences are as real as this experience. They describe the experience as precisely uh, as real. So it doesn't have any of the disjointed aspects or the dreamlike quality, you know, we all know when we're having hallucinations or dreams. Uh, there's also three angels here. And then uh, I like the, don't forget about the two Dr. Morse, I like you very much. And then again, an, an odd idiosyncratic thing that she obviously did not, uh, you know, uh, invent from, you know, cultural contamination or something. She said, this is a door down here and that this door, uh, was uh, where uh, babies and grandpas and grandmas uh, were uh, meant to go. And then the, you know, and then everything, that's, that's everything she, that she told me. And everything else, when I say to her, uh, so what did that mean? She said, I don't know. And, you know, so that's another important aspect is that they rarely embellish these experiences. You know, it's, a, you know, they, they don't just go on and on and on and on, you know, just, just says what she saw, and then she says, I don't know. Um, all right, let's see. I'm going to see if I can find another picture for you all. Okay. All right. Um, this uh, young man here, um, 
also a survivor of cardiac arrest. Uh, his uh, parents were driving home uh, from a, uh, they were uh, in a, uh, they were ski instructors. So they were coming uh, out of the Cascade Mountains uh, in a heavy snowstorm. Their car flipped over a, uh, a guardrail and plunged into a river below. And uh, they were underwater for at least 45 minutes. The, it, I, I'll just share with you because the reason that they were uh, res, you know, found and resuscitated was so uh, amazing. Uh, a, there was a uh, car behind them who was following their taillights the way that you often do when there's heavy snow. Uh, and you know, so they can't see the road, but so he was following these taillights and they suddenly disappeared. And I don't know if I would have done what this, what this uh, gentleman did, but what he did was he stopped then and he wondered why did those taillights disappear? And he looked over the edge and he saw the car down uh, in the river below. Um, so uh, this is uh, uh, this uh, young man's uh, experience. Another nice example of how when you hear these experiences, you know from children, you know that they're telling you something they actually experienced. Because he said to me, he said, first I was in the huge noodle. And then he goes, no, it couldn't have been a noodle because noodles don't have rainbows in them. So, you know, and, and and this is one of the many reasons that, you know, I feel honored, but also obligated to come and share these experiences with you, because I heard these experiences for the first time when they described them. After he's told this experience, you know, again and again and again, then it just becomes a tunnel. You know, then I was in the tunnel and I saw the rainbow, etc. But hearing it that first time with the wonder in his, you know, I was in this huge noodle. No, no, it couldn't have been a noodle. It must have been a tunnel. And uh, he went to a place he thought was a human heaven. And then he said to me, uh, but was my experience real? Because if it was real, you've got to tell all the old people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the first uh, young lady that uh, I um, uh, also immediately had that association, uh, and she went on uh, to uh, um, uh, go to uh, children's cancer units and uh, talk uh, with other children there about uh, her experience uh, of what it was like for her uh, when she uh, nearly died. Uh, so, right, you know, they, they immediately know the importance of this experience. Now, uh, th this young man was resuscitated, uh, made a full recovery. And after he said to me, but was my experience real? Then his mother said, because if his experience was real, then my experience must have been real. And here was her experience. Her experience was she was in the back passenger seat of the car. She managed uh, to kick herself free uh, and uh, shatter uh, the windshield of the car and uh, was then uh, rescued and pulled uh, out of the river. And uh, she was, uh, you know, then by the, you know, the, the side of the river watching the resuscitation efforts, uh, you know, they put a, a blanket around her, et cetera. And she said that she had the perception that her husband was sitting there next to uh, her. And she looked over at him and she said that he was very calm and peaceful. And he said to her, everything is okay. That this is, this is just as it's supposed to be. And she became enraged. I mean, she's like, how could you possibly say that? You know, they're down there trying to uh, pull our, you know, our son to safety. Um, uh, and uh, she, uh, you know, sort of uh, gestured at him, and then he disappeared. But when he was there, he was, you know, again, vividly real, just like this experience. 
Uh, and in fact, uh, he was not sitting uh, next to uh, her. Uh, he was trapped in the car uh, and uh, did not make it out of the car. Um, but that's an example of, of, you know, of what I'm sharing with you, that, that the near-death experience, knowing that those experiences are real, which we can study and have, um, that that then validated for her, uh, her perception uh, that her uh, husband was there uh, next to her, uh, comforting her, uh, you know, so her uh, experience of him after he died. Um, and subsequent, uh, you know, he has uh, returned to her again and again and again, and she knows that those are real experiences. Um, so the children drew me uh, any number of pictures uh, of their experiences. Um, see, I can show you this one here. Uh, this is a, <laughs> th this uh, young man uh, did tell his parents uh, about his experience. His experience happened uh, when uh, he was uh, a, a toddler uh, and uh, he was uh, hospitalized, uh, nearly died. Uh, of a, a serious lung condition. Um, he said that uh, he was, this is a tunnel. You can see this sort of dark and then it's going up to this light. And then he said that this world up here, this is uh, was golden fields where he could run and double jump with God. Um, the reason that his parents knew about that this had happened to him was they took him to one of these passion plays when he was around three years or four years old. And he started crying and telling them, that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. I've met the real Jesus. <laughs> and that's not Jesus. And uh, he then uh, told his parents uh, about uh, the experience that uh, he had had, um, you know, uh, when, uh, when he was much younger. Um, all righty, let's, let me, uh, here's, whoa, I love this picture here. Um, we can see uh, that this uh, young lady here is coming out of the tunnel and you can see how she's sort of coming out of the tunnel. And then uh, this is a field uh, with flowers and colors that don't exist in this uh, world. And that's in fact correct. Uh, we, <clears throat> we only see a very small part of the visual spectrum. Many, many colors exist that we can't see as human beings. And it makes sense to me that once our brain gets out of the way, uh, that then we would uh, be able to experience uh, all the colors. Um, I, I want to leave time for questions, but um, I, I will tell you that uh, the 22 uh, out of our 26 children, uh, in fact, uh, described some sort of near-death experience. None of our control uh, patients. The, those were the ones that followed, uh, you know, the, the, the rules of neurology as I was taught them. Um, you know, they, they just didn't remember being in the hospital. Uh, you know, their uh, severe trauma wipes out our short-term memory. Uh, you know, they, they really didn't remember being in the hospital at all. Um, the children uh, who had near-death experiences also had the same memory gap. You know, typically, for example, uh, one girl uh, that uh, we resuscitated, we put a needle in her heart to restart it. So that's near death. I mean, so we, we don't have to, you know, wonder, you know, are these, you know, like a, often I see, are they, well, not really near death, et cetera. Um, that's, that's near death. She didn't remember anything about uh, being taken to the hospital. She didn't remember anything about uh, the ambulance ride. She didn't remember anything about the, being in the intensive care unit. And uh, she um, uh, didn't remember anything until she was back home again. Except, as I was sharing with you earlier, at the point of death, then consciousness returned. So she has one vivid memory. And that memory was when she said to me, when I heard you calling for that crash cart and everything, that's the memory that she has. So right at the point of death, her consciousness returns. 
she said that she left her physical body. Um, and she said, I saw my grandmother there. So, you know, again, you know, some sort of a figure uh, accompany her or helping her with this transition. And she goes, I was just so shocked to see her <laughs> because, you know, her grandmother had died. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so that that's, you know, when you hear these experiences for the first time, you know that they're telling the real, you know, the, I mean, this is exactly as, as you can imagine is, you know, if, 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 uh, you know, she, she leaves her physical body, uh, she, she doesn't really know that she's died. And suddenly she sees her grandmother. I was just so shocked to see her. And then she said to me, and then I was back. And I said, what do you mean you were back? And she clenches her fist. She goes, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> so, so again, the, the, these are fragments of experiences. Um, hearing them from children in many ways, uh, to me, validates their reality. Because oftentimes as adults, when, you know, I'm, I'm, I know that on your program, you've heard adult near-death experiences. They're usually very long. They're very detailed. They fill in all these gaps, you know, et cetera. Um, but the simplicity and the, the, just the purity of the child, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> and you know, you know that the, this is in fact a real experience that happened to her. Um, so we published our um, findings in the American Medical Association's pediatric journals. Um, there can be no doubt that, uh, you know, our, well, our conclusion, which we published was that this experience is the dying experience. Um, you know, just, just to share with you, because I know it's a common thing that I'm always, I'm always hearing they say, well, well isn't that just, aren't, aren't these experiences just neurochemicals at the point of death? Well, yeah, <laughs> they are. <laughs> I mean, everything is neurochemicals. Um, this experience we're having right now is neurochemicals. Uh, regardless of, how the experience is mediated, whether it's this neurochemical or that neurochemical or whatever, it's the dying experience. It's an experience that we're all going to have. And there is no doubt that even in the most traumatic situations, there is no sense of pain. And, and this, <clears throat> this, this sort of helper, I just have to tell you uh, one that I, I just... I love these experiences for uh, hearing them from children. Um, the, we resuscitated this young girl. Uh, this was uh, uh, in the you know pre uh, GFI uh, switches uh, in bathrooms. Uh, she uh, decided that she was going to have a, a radio while she was uh, taking a bath, and she nearly electrocuted herself. Uh, and uh, we resuscitated her. And afterwards, she says to me, "You know." It was just so nice that you had that nurse there that was holding my hand so I wasn't scared. Well, we actually don't have a nurse that holds their hand uh, while we're resuscitating them. Uh, there's just, you know, there's too much to do. And there's a, you know, I mean, it would be nice, actually, you know, it would be, be nice if we had that. But, you know, I said to her, well, how did you know that it was, you know, uh, and she said, well, it was this lady and she was all dressed in white. And she just was, you know, she just told me everything was gonna be all right and she held my hand. You know, so, you know, again, I, I think that, you know, if this was an adult, uh, you know, then they would, you know, fill in all the blanks. They would say, this was an angel, this was, a, you know, et cetera. But this child just described exactly what she experienced. And these experiences aren't at all, uh, you know, most of them are Christian, uh, you know, they see Jesus. Uh, one girl that we resuscitated, uh, she said to me that uh, at her bedside were doctors. I said, well, yeah, I mean, they, there were doctors at your bedside. She said, no, they were 14 feet tall and they had light bulbs in their bodies. <laughs> and, and, and they... Um, you know, indicated to her uh, that, uh, that, you know, that she could, uh, you know, go with them, um, uh, you know, that, you know, that this was, uh, you know, the, I think another child will call these are, you know, uh, 
an adult would call these angels. But she's describing to us exactly what she sees, and then she's putting it in terms that are uh, best for her to understand. Uh, I'm going to share with you, I told you that the 22 out of 26 uh, of the patients described near-death experiences. I want to share with you uh, one uh, experience uh, where the child actually had no memories. Um, so this was, uh, you know, we, we, because of the way our study was designed, we had to say that this child did not have a near-death experience. However, uh, she was in a rowboat, uh, or uh, not a rowboat, you know, but a, a small boat um, uh, with her father at Lake Washington. And uh, she accidentally slipped over the side uh, and uh, fell into the water um, of uh, Lake Washington, uh, and she couldn't swim. Uh, her father and a friend uh, who were uh, there immediately jumped into the water uh, and dove down to try to find her. And of course they couldn't. Um, it, you know, it, is, uh, it was an overcast day and uh, they were frantically uh, diving. Except suddenly they saw a light. They saw a light that was coming out of her body. And that light guided them to her. And uh, they uh, were able to uh, then, uh, you know, pull her to the surface, and she was ultimately resuscitated. She had no memory for her experience, but nevertheless, this is a pretty powerful spiritual experience. Um, it was so much so that the father, uh, you know, the way I think we all are, you know, the, when we're confronted with these things, we can't quite believe them right away. Um, so uh, the next uh, the weekend. Uh, he and his friend are rented scuba deer, and they actually went to the bottom of, uh, you know, they dove down into Lake Washington because they wanted to see whether maybe it was some stray, you know, sunlight or maybe some, you know, weird refraction through the water of the sun or something, you know, and of course it wasn't, you know, of course they were just down there in the darkness. Um, so it's, uh, the process of dying is very spiritual. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's simply, is no doubt about it. Um, it's a scientific fact. Uh, after we published our study, uh, uh, Pin van Lummel, a uh, Dutch cardiologist, uh, did a similar study of adults, again, prospectively identifying survivors of cardiac arrest and then systematically interviewing them uh, and uh, hearing what their experiences were. And he published uh, his uh, findings in The Lancet. So we published ours in the American Medical Association's pediatric journals. Uh, the Lancet is arguably the world's most prestigious medical journal. So again, when you hear people say, well, science, uh, no, you know, we've, uh, we have we are the scientists and uh, we published uh, in peer reviewed uh, the most prestigious medical journals, uh, our findings. And these findings tell us that the process of dying is, is spiritual. It's incredibly spiritual dynamics, uh, and I think then validates all these other spiritual experiences, the shared dying experience, the after-death communications, the premonitions of death. Uh, they all fit with one, one picture that the process of dying uh, is spiritual. Uh, I, I, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I, to, to lose a child, I, you know, I think that separation, you know, I, I, you know, obviously that doesn't address that issue, but it certainly addresses the other issues. Uh, and certainly if you have the perception, as many people do, that, uh, you know, that your child is still with you, uh, I'm sure that's correct. Uh, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, our research certainly uh, would bear that out. Uh, I've got time for questions or Wonderful. yes, let's take some questions. Oh my gosh. I just loved listening to all of this. And we have so many people in the chat box. Um, very, very, who are very excited about what you're saying. Um, I, I just want to first say Kimberly is saying that they should really teach a course to those in training for the medical field on this. Obviously she says I am a nurse and most of my career has been in critical care and end of life care. I wish I had known what I do now as I would have been a much better support for my patients. 
Um, is that something that you could maybe address? That is um, my passion. Um, just briefly, uh, we spend so much money wastefully on the uh, uh, last uh, few days of life. And um, it, it's, you know, we, we separate, you know, well, time motion studies show that both doctors uh, and often nurses don't spend as much time at the bedside uh, when uh, someone is dying. Uh, we tend to isolate ourselves uh, from death and dying, even, even today. Uh, and the dying have something to teach us. And I think that if we started to understand that the process of dying is spiritual, in fact, joyous. <laughs> I mean, as I know that that it's, it's very hard to say, you know, particularly, and, and and I feel I can say it as a critical care physician because I think I know more than uh, most that it does not seem at all joyous. Uh, you know, it is uh, brutal and uh, difficult. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is hard. Um, and yet those who survive it tell us that it's joyous. Uh, and I think that that, if we knew that, that could then reverse uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the uh, dehumanization of the dying process and the, the excessive, uh, I, I mean, I'm talking about medical interventions, which do not prolong life one second and yet cost millions of dollars and uh, put a layer of trauma uh, over uh, the whole situation, uh, which just, you know, uh, separates, uh, uh, you know, loved ones from uh, their, uh, you know, from the dying. So, yeah, <laughs> that's something I could talk about for a long time, Elizabeth. I think that uh, near-death experiences have the potential to revolutionize uh, the way we treat uh, death and dying. I love this. This is so exciting to me. I, I must say that I, I just can't stop smiling because everything that you've said this evening has been so wonderful for all of our parents. And I truly appreciate it. In fact, one of our caring listeners, Nancy, is saying, I love his sense of compassion and shared wonder. It's a perfect choice for this, um, for, for our group, obviously, to be able to listen to what you're saying and to look at those beautiful drawings by children who obviously are not making these things up. Yeah. They're, they're just telling it like it is. They are not wanting to be on a reality show. They're not wanting to, um, they're, they're just wanting to let you know what happened during the experience. I wanted to ask you, there are other questions as well, but I wanted to ask you about, um, I believe that you've done research on uh, people, uh, children who are in comas as well. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that, um, what you've learned from that? I frankly uh, assume that someone in a coma can hear and process everything that is going on around them. Um, that that's uh, you know, regardless of how uh, you know uh, how you know told that they're brain dead or you know I mean the things that we often thoughtlessly as as physicians uh, will say, um, because the brain isn't everything. That's that's what you know that that's what we're learning is that consciousness uses the brain. So that we can have this this life, you know, so that we can interact and, and learn our lessons of love and, and the other reasons, uh, you know, that we're here uh, in, in this uh, shared reality. Um, but uh, so, you know, the, the idea that somebody is in a vegetative coma, uh, that doesn't address the issue, though, that their spirit may still be uh, in, in their body. And, uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, working uh, with uh, mediums and such uh, is, you know, at least in the science world, the, the world that uh, I'm in uh, is, uh, you know, controversial to say the least. Uh, but nevertheless, um, we work uh, with a medium um, who contacted uh, a, a man who was in coma. And uh, there can be no doubt that uh, this was a real experience. Um, she had uh, no way of knowing uh, what his uh, circumstances were. 
and yet he was able uh, she was able to um tell you know uh, everything that was he was experiencing um and was able to actually uh, help his care uh because uh, he was uh, able to communicate uh so i mean i i know you know as, as startling as that is that's again going back to the near death research i guess that's why i want to emphasize how solid that research is because once that research is understood it, it's a paradigm shift and then such, such you know things like mediumship etc uh, become uh, very possible uh, very understandable that's amazing and very very exciting as well uh noreen is saying this was phenomenal i've been a nurse for three decades um wish the physicians i'd worked with um were as open and compassionate the drawing of the leader of the code wearing the hat is incredible most people don't know that this is normal during a code how could a child know exactly yeah <laughs> Right. That's just beautiful. Um, I, I I also just want to tell you that everyone is saying thank you, Dr. Morris. What a beautiful gift to all of us. Um, love this. Thank you so much. More confirmation. Thank you so much for doing these interviews with children. Amazing. Um, I could listen to this forever. So interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris. Your words brought me great comfort at a difficult time. Um, Thank you so much for this. It has been so comforting and affirming. This is beautiful. What a wonderful doctor. Um, we do have a question. Uh, is the AMA receptive to these ideas? What is your uh, is the response of your colleagues? Do you think that this dying experience is gaining momentum as the norm? This is from Callista. <clears throat> um, I think it's slow. <laughs> uh, I, I think... You know, paradigm shifts, we've, you know, we know the history of paradigm shifts. We've seen them, uh, you know, throughout, the, you know, in the scientific world. Unfortunately, it usually means that the older, the older guard has to, uh, you know, retire, et cetera. And the, then uh, the younger uh, physicians have to take up uh, positions as uh, chairman of departments uh, and head of uh, departments, et cetera. Um, so I think uh, among young physicians, uh, this is, uh, you know, when I talk with young uh, neuroscientists, etc., uh, you know, they speak very casually of the mind brain body, you know, just as, as one entity. But um, I think it is challenging for, you know, because I can understand, you know, uh, they are like I, I introduced myself, I trained at Johns Hopkins, we're trained that the brain is all there is and that the brain creates consciousness. Interestingly enough, there's no proof of that, you know. I mean that's just an assumption. Um but it's a it's a, a deep rooted uh, assumption. Uh so I would say that um uh there has been slow progress in the last 30 years. Um, but I would not say uh, it's uh, caught on yet. Uh, I, but I think that uh, in another uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, when we see, you know, the physicians who are now in their 30s and 40s, when they start to run hospitals and they start to run intensive care units, that's when we'll see change. That's wonderful. We have a, a time for one more question. Megan has asked, for me, I'm already confident in all of this because my daughter has taught me. I feel it in my soul. But this was great to help me teach others about the greater reality, which I feel is a part of my soul mission. I appreciate this research. Did I hear uh, someone say there's a book we can read? I'd love to read the study. Do you have any um, anything that we can recommend to be able to read more about this? And uh, also I wrote um, uh, actually four books on this. Um, these books are in the library. So, uh, well, first of all, that'll tell you how I think uh, well accepted our research is. Um, you know, I, I live in rural uh, South Carolina and, and our library has, uh, has these books. Uh, so uh, the first book I wrote was Closer to the Light. And that has uh, summarized uh, our uh, study at Seattle Children's Hospital and uh, the experiences of the children. 
I then wrote a book called Transformed by the Light, in which we studied adults who had these experiences as children, so we could see what it was like to live a life of being, you know, uh, touched by this light. And I, I can just summarize it for you. Know, this is the big secret of life, by the way. Um, we're supposed to be nice. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we're supposed to be kind and we're supposed to be nice. And, 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 and particularly for me, this is very hard for me to learn. All the stuff that I thought was so important, you know, publishing books and <laughs> papers, and I was like a, you know, big overachiever and all that kind of stuff. Actually, none of that matters. Um, that, that, that when we die and we have our life review, usually we're shown, you know, things like, you know, were we kind? Uh, did we help out somebody uh, when we could have helped them, uh, et cetera? Uh, I then wrote a book called Parting Visions, and that's a book about the, uh, the whole spectrum of spiritual experiences. Uh, and then I finally wrote a book called Where God Lives, which is about the neuroscience of uh, near-death uh, research. Um, and again, you know, <laughs> I know I sound like a broken record because I'm only, <laughs> but I always hear this, but scientists don't believe in this. I published my book, uh, Where God Lives, in 2005. So, that, you know, that was over a decade ago, in which we concluded that our brain is actually hardwired to be able to communicate with God, that that's actually part of our, uh, uh, you know, just like we can see with our eyes and just like we can smell. All right. Since then, uh, we have not had anybody in the scientific literature dispute our findings other than a guy named Mario Beauregard who said, no, no, they're all wrong. It's not a God spot. It's a God brain. He showed that probably one third of the brain is dedicated to, uh, uh, you know, being uh, spiritual. And so again, that validates, you know, if you've had a spiritual experience, if you think that your child has come back to you and said, mommy, I'm okay now, it's not a hallucination. That's the one third of the spiritual part of your brain that's working properly just like you have a part of your brain that allows you to hear what I'm saying now, just like you have a part of the brain which interprets uh, the visual uh, images that come into our eyes. Um, so, you know, this, uh, this research uh, that uh, our brains uh, are uh, spiritually wired uh, to appreciate God, uh, again, hasn't been disputed uh, since we first published it and has only been uh, built on uh, since then. Wow. Amazing. And I also wanted uh, to be able to find out, it, are, is it possible to see uh, some of the other images that you have available? Are they in uh, any of these books so that people can um, maybe take a, take a look at the other beautiful pictures that these children have drawn? Well, I have a website. It's melvinmorsemd.com. And I've got uh, on there videos, uh, interviews with the children, and uh, I have uh, many oh. pictures there. It's just it's wondervorsmd.com. Okay, wonderful. I think that, that some people are uh, unmuting already, but uh, because we're coming up on the hour, and I just want to thank you for spending time with us this evening. Oh, that it's, was it's just my, my, this was so fascinating. Thank you so much. I mean, we've had some of this information relayed by mediums for some of us, but to have the proof, you know, you've got the children, you've interviewed them, you have the pictures. It just makes it all the more meaningful. So thank you. This was wonderful. You're welcome. Thank you very thank much. You. And we always ask everyone to unmute and say thank you. And I good read your book in the 90s when I was a hospice nurse, and it changed everything for me. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. This was so wonderful and so helpful. Thank you. Great meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any experience with suicide?